Welcome to Whiskey Cast, cask strength conversation featuring news and interviews from the world of whiskey. I'm Mark Gillespie. This is episode number 646 for June 18th, 2017. Coming up in a few minutes. Richard jokes that if we wanted to do the same thing in a straight shot, we'd have to buy a building a few blocks away before we could to put the condensers and get the same, the same kind of physics that was going on. So that was a really good idea on there and it ends up looking pretty crazy. It looks like worm tub just sticking on top of the swan neck, you know. I spent a couple of days this past week with Jared Hempstead and the folks at Balconis Distilling in Waco, Texas. It's been a little more than a year since Balconis moved production from its original distillery under the 17th Street Bridge in Waco to its new distillery on the edge of downtown. And the furor over the controversial exit of Balconis founder Chip Tate has finally faded. Jared Hempstead was at Balconis from the beginning and reflects a bit on the distillery's past and a lot on the future later with us on WhiskeyCast In-Depth. I'll also have the calendar of events, this week's Your Voice, and the What I'm Tasting This Week department all coming up on this week's WhiskeyCast. WhiskeyCast, brought to you by Redbreast, the definitive single pot still Irish whiskey. Those in the know, no red breast. You don't need a special occasion to celebrate with something truly unique, but a personally engraved bottle of Johnny Walker Blue Label can make any occasion special. Support for Whiskey Cast comes from Johnny Walker. Visit johnnywalker.com to find out more about engraving options near you. Let's get started with the week's news. It's brought to you by Highland Park. Distillers have been making so-called sour mash whiskey for nearly two centuries. In fact, we're just six years away from the 200th anniversary of the invention of sour mash distilling by Dr. James Crow back in 1823 at what we now know as the Woodford Reserve Distillery in Kentucky. He came up with the idea of taking some of the mash left over after fermentation and setting it back to be added to the next batch of mash along with the yeast. The idea is that that slightly acidic and yeast-filled spent mash not only helps kick off the fermentation of the next batch, but also controls bacteria that could cause problems with fermentation. Of course, the process has been refined over the years, and the U.S. Patent Office has issued a number of patents for those refinements. This week, Buffalo Trace kicked over the proverbial hornet's nest, with the news that it has applied for a patent on a 150-year-old variation on the sour mash process. Colonel E. H. Taylor Jr. developed his old-fashioned sour mash process when he owned what was then the OFC distillery. Buffalo Trace will only say that Taylor's sour mash process does not use spent mash, but accomplishes the same result naturally through the holding time between mashing and fermenting. The distillery used this process back in 2002 for the whiskey that became the first release in the Colonel E. H. Taylor series of whiskeys back in 2011. It's been making more since then and plans to even try using some of Taylor's old fermenters that were uncovered during construction work last year. Now, the patent process takes almost as long as it takes most whiskeys to mature, And Buffalo Trace will label any future whiskeys made using Taylor's sour mash process with the words patent pending. As for that hornet's nest, well, social media was full of critics this week questioning whether one should be able to patent a natural process, let alone one that's been in use for more than a century at least. In other news, Ireland's Teeling Whiskey Company opened its distillery in Dublin's Liberties neighborhood two years ago, and has pulled the trigger on an expansion project. Jack and Stephen Teeling will be investing €500,000 to expand both production capacity and event space at the distillery over the next year. The project is expected to be completed next June, which is when Teeling will release its first fully matured whiskey from the distillery. There's a family breakup to report in Northern California, where the Karakasevich family is splitting Charbet into two companies. Now, don't worry about this one. It's a peaceful split. 
Marco and Jenny Karakasevich have purchased the Charbet Distillery from Marco's parents and will keep making Charbet's whiskeys and spirits. Miles and Susan Karakasevich are keeping the Charbet Winery and will focus on wines and aperitifs. Old Pulteney's 17 and 21 year old single malts have won a number of awards over the years. If you see them on the shelf, it might be worth grabbing one while you still can. Inverhouse has confirmed that both are being discontinued as current supplies run out at retailers, but will be replaced soon by other aged expressions. No word yet on what those ages will be, though. I've mentioned the Four Kings project over the last couple of years, where Few Spirits, Mississippi River Distilling Company, Corsair, and Journeyman Distillery have collaborated on a joint whiskey each year. Well, four Colorado distillers are now doing the same thing. Woods High Mountain Distillery, Bear Creek, State 38 Distilling, and Woody Creek Distillers have blended their rye whiskey distillate and filled a single 53-gallon barrel that was donated by Independent Stave. The barrel will be stored at Woody Creek for at least the next two years and will eventually be bottled as a straight rye whiskey with all of the bottles to be donated to local charities for fundraising. I'll keep you posted on the progress of the Colorado Whiskey Collaboration Project as time goes on. And he hopes that the Chicago Cubs would keep it classy as they celebrate their first World Series win since 1908. Probably ended this past week when the Cubs started selling preserved leaves of ivy picked off the Wrigley Field walls after the World Series for 200 bucks each. However, there is a bourbon-related collectible that's a lot cheaper. Jim Beam has started selling a Game 7 batch bottling in the Chicago area, and feel free to roll your eyes at this one. They claimed in a news release that the whiskey was matured on November 2nd, the day the Cubs won Game 7 of the series. Now, to be fair, the barrels could have been dumped that day. The bottles do come with a special label and a commemorative blue cap, and carry a recommended retail price of $17.99 a bottle. It's all part of the partnership Jim Beam and the Cubs began this spring, as Beam Suntory moves its corporate headquarters into downtown Chicago from the suburbs. Other news from Bourbon Country. We mentioned this one earlier in the year when first word leaked out, but Beam has now released its 25th anniversary edition of Knob Creek Bourbon, it's a cask-strength single-barrel bottling from barrels of 12- and 13-year-old whiskey selected by Fred No. The recommended retail price, $130 a bottle. You won't be able to get this one until the fall, but Heaven Hill has confirmed that this year's edition of Parker's Heritage Collection will be an 11-year-old single-barrel bourbon. This year's edition will be the first one since Parker Beam passed away in January after his long battle with ALS. And the whiskey was matured in one of his favorite warehouses in Dietzville, Kentucky, on the site of the old T.W. Samuels Distillery. I'll have more details as they become available. Wyoming Whiskey has released a commemorative eclipse edition leading up to the total solar eclipse that will pass over much of the U.S. August 21st. The reason? The path of the eclipse will cross over Wyoming from west to east as it goes from Oregon down to South Carolina. Now, this whiskey is a bit different from the standard Wyoming whiskey small batch. The 26 barrels were picked this spring by head distiller Sam Mead. It's only available through retailers in Wyoming, but there are some who ship outside the state. Meanwhile, Redemption Whiskey is releasing its first weeded bourbon. The mash bill is 45% wheat, 51% corn, 4% malted barley. It is distilled at MGP and will be available in most large U.S. cities. Clyde Mays has followed up on last year's 8-year-old cask-strength American whiskey with a new 9-year-old version. It'll be rolling out over the summer and will carry a recommended price of $100 a bottle. Turning now to the Scotch whiskey front, I want to take you back to January. During episode 625 from the Victoria Whiskey Festival, when the Balvenies' Sam Simmons gave us a hint of the distillery's latest release, a peated Balveny. We've had a peat week since 2001 at the distillery when uh, Ian Miller started deciding to put some peat through the maltings to do some experiments. And then we started bringing in peated, make, peated, I'm sorry, peated uh, barley commercially 
repeated barley into the distillery to put through the system. And the results were great. So David, I'm sorry, Ian just decided in consulting with David Stewart, let's start doing a peat week every year. So that's what we did. And uh, ever since 2001, we've been doing that. The guys hate it. You know, it changes the smell of the whole site. Never mind the whiskey. It makes a, it's a very different Baldeni. It's still sweet and honeyed, but it adds a, obviously a peaty character. But it's not like a Isla peat because we use St. Fergus Highland uh, peat. So the influence of flavor is quite different. But yeah, we have the stock. We've been doing it for years. It's one of these secrets of our stock model at uh, the distillery that you know, not everyone knows what we do behind the scenes. David's job is maintaining a warehouse full of liquid. And we've always been making interesting liquid. Not all of it gets to public consumption, but now we're thinking maybe it's time to do something with this 14-year-old stock that we have. Well, they did. The Balvenny peated triple cask 14-year-old was unveiled officially this week. It's a travel retail exclusive that's bottled at 48.3% ABV. It'll sell for 65 pounds, about $83 a bottle. La Martini Case is revamping its Label 5 line of blended scotches. The whiskies are blended at Glen Murray Distillery in Speyside by master distiller and blender Graham Cool. Label 5 Gold Heritage and the 12- and 18-year-old versions get their debuts this week at the Vin Expo in Bordeaux, France. Glendronach has released its first batch of single-cask bottlings since Rachel Berry became the distillery's whiskey maker this spring. There are six single malts in the batch, ranging in age from 21 years old to 27 years old. And as you might expect from Glendronach, all six are either Oloroso or PX Sherry casks. No word on pricing. News on another single cask, this one from Douglas Lang & Company. The old particular Ben Nevis, 20-year-old, is the second in the Consortium of Cards series that began earlier this year. This one is dubbed the King of the Hills. It was matured in a refill sherry butt and bottled at 50% ABV. It's one of six old particular bottlings released globally this month. Glen Turret's legendary distiller cat Towser now has her own whiskey. Towser is featured on the latest Bottle Your Own cask at the distillery's famous grouse experience. Towser was the resident mouser at Glen Turret from 1963 all the way up until 1987. The whiskey is a 13-year-old single malt matured in a first fill American Oak Sherry Punchin. It sells for 85 pounds a bottle, with 5 pounds from each sale going to the Snow Leopard Trust. And on the Japanese whiskey front, Elixir Distillers is now the new name for the independent bottling unit of Speciality Drinks, which is part of the whiskey exchange family. It's coming out with two vintage Kuruazawa single casks from 1981 and 1984. The 1981 bottling is a 33-year-old sherry cask, bottled at 63.4% ABV. 129 bottles are available at a price of 2,750 pounds. That's about $3,500. The 1984 edition is also a sherry cask, bottled at 59.4% ABV. 225 bottles of that one carry a price tag of 2,500 pounds, about $3,200. You can keep up on the latest whiskey news all week long at whiskeycast.com. The news is brought to you by Highland Park, the Orkney single malt with Viking soul, and a brand new website. Check it out today at highlandparkwhiskey.com. You don't need a special occasion to open a bottle of Johnny Walker Blue Label. But when you have a special occasion, why not celebrate with a specially engraved bottle of Johnny Walker Blue Label? Here's how one whiskey lover celebrated his team's recent success. He arranged to have 108 specially engraved bottles of Johnny Walker Blue Label made for his co-workers. You might say he hit a home run. Just like a perfectly executed double play, Johnny Walker Blue Label is smooth and well-rounded, and unlike a trophy, never needs polishing. Support for WhiskeyCast comes from Johnny Walker. Visit johnnywalker.com to find out more about engraving options near you. Johnny Walker Blue Label Blended Scotch Whiskey, 40% alcohol by volume. Imported by Diageo North America, Norwalk, Connecticut. Please drink responsibly. Just a quick reminder for our friends in the Houston area, I'll be leading a tasting at Reserve 101 on July 25th. 
We're still working out the tasting list, but tickets are $20 each, and all of the proceeds will go to the Rescued Pets Movement, which helps relocate rescued pets from the Houston area to new homes across the U.S. There's a link for tickets on the calendar of events page at whiskeycast.com. Let's open up the inbox now for this week's Your Voice. I try to spend a little time each week answering whiskey questions on Quora.com, and Veos Flohatasios asked this one the other day. I just bought a bottle of Laphroaig but left it by mistake for two hours, max, maybe less, sideways. Was it enough to ruin my whiskey, or is it fine? Well, as I answered on Quora, two hours, you're fine. Two years, mm, that might have caused a problem. I've addressed this question before, but it is always worth repeating. Generally, it's not wise to store whiskey bottles on their sides as you would traditionally do with wine bottles. With wine, you want to keep the cork moist so that it doesn't shrink and allow air to get inside and oxidize the wine. On the other hand, the alcoholic content of whiskeys is several times that of wines, and long-term exposure to the alcohol can degrade the cork. Of course, whiskey bottles do spend a lot of time on their sides during the shipping process, so a couple of hours isn't going to be a problem. And by the way, this advice does not apply to whiskeys with screw caps and should not be an issue with synthetic corks. The problem is, until you open the bottle, you won't generally know whether the cork is natural or synthetic. Turning to Twitter now, Larry Kilborn at LPHD on Twitter had this comment on last week's interview with Tom Bullitt. Great interview with a really interesting guy. I enjoyed meeting him and chatting a few years ago. Thanks, Larry. I also wanted to thank the folks at Auto Radio, a fairly new podcast aggregator on the scene. They included last week's episode on their foodie radio list of podcasts this week. Jeff Lincecombe tweets under his own name and asks this question. Heading to Isla next month after a week-long spiritual retreat on Iona. What dram of spirit should I pair with the spirit? Well, my inner smartass came out of its own spiritual retreat and tweeted, After a week-long spiritual retreat, I'd say whatever the spirit moves you to, or else the first dram that comes to mind. And I'm not the only one whose inner smartass came out to play. Former Brook Laddie boss Mark Rainier responded, Not black art, obviously. Well, I'd disagree with Mark on that one. My own impression is that the angels on Isla seem to enjoy a little black art now and then. If you'd like to let your inner smart ass come out and play, just be nice when you post your comments on the Your Voice page at whiskeycast.com. You can also find us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Tumblr at WhiskeyCast. And my email address is comments at whiskeycast.com. Redbreast fans have always cherished our whiskey's sherry notes, so we set out to embellish that character. Introducing the Redbreastless Stout Edition, a quintessential single pot still Irish whiskey finished in first fill Oloroso sherry casks from Spain's prestigious Bodegas Le Stout. Carrying Redbreast's trademark pot still spices and dark dried fruit notes, the Listeau edition is graced with an enduring sherry finish that will be better described as a final act. Discover the newest branch on the Redbreast family tree. Redbreast Lustau is now the latest award-winning member of the Redbreast family. It is Whiskey Advocates 2016 Irish Whiskey of the Year. Try a bottle for yourself. Time now for the calendar of events brought to you by Wyoming Whiskey. Whiskey Live Hobart is coming up this Saturday in Australia along with Rocktown Distillery's 7th Anniversary Party in Little Rock, Arkansas, and M.B. Rowland Distillery's Kentucky Tiki Party in Pembroke, Kentucky. McTears has its next whiskey auction on June 30th in Glasgow, Scotland. Maker's Mark Distillery opens a special exhibition of Dale Chihuly's artwork July 1st that will run through October as part of the distillery's tours. But there's a special glass and brass opening party on July 1st at the distillery in Loretto, Kentucky. Journeyman Distillery's annual Corsets, Whips, and Whiskey Festival is also on July 1st. It's in Three Oaks, Michigan. And there's a Compass Box Whiskey tasting on July 8th at Fairways Golf Club in Warrington, Pennsylvania. Finally, the West Coast Whiskey Fage is on July 22nd in Oban, Scotland. 
Those are just a few of the 149 different events worldwide on our searchable calendar at whiskeycast.com. If you have a tasting or an event you'd like to add to the list, just use the contact form on our website and let us know about it. The calendar of events is brought to you by Wyoming Whiskey. There's a whiskey. It hails from the West. Kirby, Wyoming in the Bighorn Basin, to be precise. Crafted from only Wyoming natural ingredients and water from a limestone aquifer that lies a mile below the ground. It then spends five years in the barrel in the most unique maturation environment in the world, all under the careful eye of our distiller Sam Mead. The result? A singular bourbon that will disappear and live forever. Wyoming Whiskey, the whiskey of the West. Whiskey Cast in Depth is brought to you by Lagavulin. I spent a couple of days this week in Waco, Texas, visiting the folks at Balconis Distilling, both the original distillery that opened in 2008 and their new state-of-the-art distillery that opened up last year. Jared Hempstead was right alongside Balconis founder Chip Tate as they built that original distillery under the 17th Street Bridge in Waco, and he took over as head distiller after the controversial divorce between Tate and his investors led to his departure in late 2014. Over the last couple of years, Jared has put his own stamp on the Balconis range, and the new distillery is giving Balconis the ability to produce much more whiskey than ever before. In fact, they're installing a second set of massive stills as we speak. Now, before we begin my conversation with Jared Hempstead, Let's address the elephant in the room first. There are two words you will not hear during this interview. Chip Tate. That was my decision. No one at Balconis asked me to avoid mentioning Chip, but I should note that there is still some litigation that has never been resolved, and the legal settlement between the two sides does include non-disparagement language. Besides, I made the choice in this interview to focus on the future of Balconis instead of the past, starting with what the new Balconis distillery allows Jared and his team to do that they could not do in that old distillery under the bridge. Well, we're running steam, so some of the control and predictability. Um, I know some, some guys just get the steam rolling and you just go and you make cuts and you're not actually adjusting around cut points or increasing reflux for different things at different parts of the day. Um, but we do a decent amount of that, so the predictability of knowing what time of day, how long we're going to be at this spot before we're going to need to check and turn up or turn down and all that um, used to require a lot of going to the stills. Like I was saying earlier, every 20, 30 minutes you have to go check on things. Um, so make, we make a lot better use of time because there's plenty of other things to be doing. Um, but also, um, I think consistency is probably going to be better. We haven't, we've only been here a little bit over a year, so it's hard to say yet, but the gas was so finicky. We had some needle valves put in, but um, it was so hard to make really small adjustments for so long over there. I mean, literally kind of like tap a, the arm on the valve and hope you, you know, it's like, I think I moved it about a millimeter. I mean, you had to just kind of guesstimate. Um, it wasn't coming off PSI. It wasn't reading BTUs. It was just like, I think that's, hopefully that was enough. And then you have to taste it. Like, oh, it didn't turn down quite enough. And you do it again. Now it's, you can try it every day. And the day you're like, oh, I need to drop from this PSI to this PSI at this certain time of the run. The next day you just put that number in. And it, you know what I mean? And the valve gives you exactly the amount of steam you asked for. The uh, jacketed fermenters, we didn't have that before. So it, there was a lot of annual variance on, um, even as your profiles and stuff in the summer, the fermentations get a lot warmer. In the winter, they're staying a lot cooler. Um, so now, even though we are still playing with those parameters, we can do that on purpose. And when we find something that's giving us what we're looking for, then we can replicate that a lot more consistently. And lastly, just the volume. Um, having a three-story warehouse, which we've had for five years or something like that, so we've, we've been using it, even with the product from the old building. Now, um, we were making two barrels a day. So, and I didn't have the capacity to store up like a week's worth of malt or something. Now we can, we make more every day and we can save multiple days. So doing warehouse location experiments that are apples to apples because it's the exact same juice that we saved up all week. Doing barrel profile experiments with the exact same juice. Doing proofing experiments with the exact same juice. 
things we used to do like experiment around with was all kind of anecdotal and it'd be sensory at the end of the day, but you didn't know there was two barrels of each thing. So um, just barrel variation could have accounted to something that you thought was indicative and it wasn't because you didn't have a big enough sample size. So um, it feels like we're, we're collecting data that someday, some years from now, once we have enough of it, will be really interesting and significant that there was just no way to ever do that before at that volume. And now you can actually start working on trying to meet the demand around the world for your whiskey. There's that. There's that too. Um, so far it's going pretty good. We're not sitting on a lot of product. Um, it's always a trick because we make so many different things and the age range of them is so varied. Um, that we have some things that are already online at huge volumes. We have other things that aren't quite yet. Different states, different markets want. Yeah, we'd love to take some baby, but we won't take, we're not placing an order until you have more brimstone or whatever it is that is the, out of all the different things we make, different markets kind of have, they're mostly interested in malt, but they'll take other stuff or they're mostly interested in rumble. So depending on what we do or don't have at any given point, you might be bottlenecking, you know, some other finished product upstairs, but so far it's been going pretty good. And finally too, just even friends that live here, but have family and Michigan or Wisconsin or wherever they are and they're like, man, like, they can't get it. When are you guys going to get there? It feels nice to be making steps to, it may not be ever a ton of volume in some of those states, but still just knowing people that know what we do and really enjoy it and can't get it when they're home or they're trying to tell friends, yes, you can pick some up. And it's not available. So and it's also given us, it was really hard in the past to justify. We were so behind the eight ball on demand that, um, Diverting any production from malt or corn always seemed like a bad idea because we were already under supplying so bad. Now, we're still not cut up, but it feels like there's a little more wiggle room to lay down other kind of things that are in development without being too worried about what that's doing to kind of some core products. You opened the place a little over a year ago, mm -hmm. and there's still construction going on. There's what are you doing? Yeah, there's still construction going on. We're adding a second, second still set. Um, so yeah, we talked to Forsyth when we got the first set built. And um, they were going to be so busy in 2017. I think it's Glenfiddich maybe, and Glenlivet both. We're, occupy, we're taking up their entire annual fabrication capacity. So they said, if you want to do any more than the one set, you can either order them both at the same time, basically, and get it maybe earlier than you think you need it. Or you might be waiting to 18, 19 to get it. And, um, and kind of looking at projections and stuff, it was like, we may not need it. But if the volume coming off the first still is starting to get packaged, and we realize, oh, we could have been making a bunch more this whole time, we're missing out on some market there, and then to have to wait two or three years to even start laying it down, and then not, you know, one or two years off on getting your new stills turns into four or five before that product's out. And um, yeah. Just kind of decided internally looking at the, the money that it would cost to get it done versus the potential money that could be made on the other end and it was kind of a no-brainer like if we have to eat that because we don't need it that's fine but that's a better risk to take than wishing we had built bigger more capacity into the plant and not have it um, down the road so explain the still design to me because you were trying to replicate what you had at the old place right but those stills are like nothing I've ever seen before with all the coils on top and the line arm. I've never seen a kinked up line arm the way you guys have it. Yeah, I don't know that, the, I don't think that's probably ever been done. Um, once again, these are not super, let's go make crazy looking stills. That'll be neat and people will be surprised or impressed by it. But we, our original stills, just the slope of the roof and where we had the pots and then the line arm just kind of hugged along the sloping roof and the condensers were on the other side. Um, so it was a pretty long, line arm with a pretty decent slope to it. And um, once again, that wasn't necessarily intentional to achieve a specific product when we did it, but it's the building we had. And so in trying to move, knowing there's always going to, there's always going to be some differences in running on a pot still that's shaped different and the proportions are different. But we had uh, Forsyth work pretty closely to try and replicate proportions and volumes and general shape of what we already had. Um, and that was their, I thought, a very elegant solution to the very long distance at, with the continued gradual slope that we had on the old ones, um, was just to make it kind of spiral around itself. Because um, you had something like a 25-foot line. Right. I think uh, over there, one of them was like four. They weren't even exactly the same. 
they were kind of catty cornered to the uh, condensers. One was like a 14 foot, one was like 17, I think. But um, yeah, Richard joked that if we wanted to do the same thing in a straight shot, we'd have to buy a building a few blocks away before we could <laughs> to put the condensers and get the same the same kind of physics that was going on. So that was a really good idea on there, and it ends up looking pretty crazy. It looks like a worm tub just sticking on top of the swan neck, you know. But so far, it's we've been super happy with the results. Um, Malt has been the trickiest, and it's taken us almost this whole year to kind of just slowly tweak um, how we run them, and even affecting some fermentation parameters to try and just kind of some of those fine tuning of ways that it seemed a little different. And uh, between ester stuff, fruit, body, finished things, and just um, really just like the last three months, I feel like we kind of got in a groove where we know exactly how to how to run them to get the malt the way we want it. All the American style stuff like corn or multi-grain bourbon bills have been fantastic like right off the get-go. It was super easy to rye. Um, even high ester stuff like the rum, it's always been something. It, it, it really likes making those things. So I made the comment earlier that you guys with a plant this size, it's going to be kind of hard to call you a craft distillery much longer. <laughs> and I think as Tommy put it, you guys are either a really big small distiller or a really small big distiller. Yeah. How do you define it? <clears throat> what have you guys I mean, defined it? Well, we were just talking about this the other day, how interesting it is. Um, beer has definitely obviously gone the, the volume route um, with defining where those lines are, if you're regional, if you're national, if you're craft and all that. Um, but they keep moving it, you know. They got to make sure guys like Sam Adams still get to stay in the camp, you know, be in the club. I'm glad that this conversation about craft with spirits has gone a little bit different direction lately. Um, and to a large degree, the people that are pretty consistently saying that craft is a pretty irrelevant term may or may not be onto something, but I think we can all agree that the big guys are making really good product. And knowing firsthand how much goes into way on the front end designing a product and continuing to tweak it based on sensory stuff that happens when you finally have stuff coming out the other end, and that constant dance that really can take decades or a whole lifetime, there's a lot of, the, a huge chunk of the art is happening in that, in, the, in that dynamic. And like I was saying earlier, when we went to the old building and not having agitators and the fermenters and all that stuff, it doesn't make better whiskey. Um, I think for me, as much personal interaction as the distillers can have with the product at all the different stages. Um, that's way more important to me than whether you have a motor that stirs your fermenter for you or you do it by hand or if you're using a forklift or you're hauling bags rather than putting it in a silo with an auger. I mean, there's nothing inherently better about that. And the big guys, there's a lot of craft going. I mean, obviously, some of the best blenders in the world are working with really big um, distilleries and uh, making great product, paying a lot of attention to what they're doing, being very picky, picky about quality, and that's, I mean, that's, if size, I don't know, I think, you know, people that are getting bent out of shape about size are probably on one end or the other. They're probably either really big or really small. Being in the middle kind of feels like, um, if the size, if the volume ever changed how we can relate to what we're making. If, I, if, if it made, I think the people involved in the creative side of the work felt more detached or more distant from it somehow, if that was a function of scale, then yes, I think that would need to be, you need to be self-aware enough to notice when that's happening or coming and kind of try to pump the brakes a little bit. Um, but the other thing that I don't feel like it's discussed much at all is you know, pot still versus column. I mean, I've, I've never run anything else. I would have no idea what to do with a column still. And that's a whole other nuanced side of the conversation of the, the linear narrative quality of a, a pot still distillation run versus even a batch column, much less a continuous. Um, you kind of engineered your process before you ever, and, you're, and they're tweaking it, but once you've got it down and you know how you make it, you start it up and let it go. Um, you can evaluate it when you're done. 
see what you think about what you made that day. But this kind of linear narrative flow of how a spirit still goes on a, how that spirit comes off on a pot still, to me, that's like a, that's a massive difference. When I talk to guys that are using column, I don't even, I have no idea what you do. And we don't do the same thing. This is a radically different, um, we both make whiskey. Yeah. But what that looks like and the skill set involved, I'm not saying it's more skilled, but it's, a, it's just a totally different thing. And that to me is, um, I'm not bashing anyone that uses column, but to me that would be, that would be a step where the technology for me would make me feel a lot more removed and a lot, some distance between me and the product that would be weird to me. I like having to smell it and taste it, check on it. Um, as the day goes on, you know. When you look at it in the end, you're talking about something like 11 different recipes, yeah. seven different bottled products. We were talking earlier about uh, who you compare yourselves to. Yeah. <clears throat> and really, I don't think there are many other craft distillers or big guys, however you want to put it, who try to make as many different products as you guys make yeah. with multiple grains, and using a similar process with the pot stills, but really trying to be as complex as you can and making a whole wide range of different things, right. other than maybe Corsair at most. Right. How do you guys compare yourselves to other folks in the industry? Um, I mean, it comes up a lot, especially when you're trying to have strategy and guys, guys in the company that have more spirits exp experience and they're trying to look at markets and... Uh, sales approaches and how do you differentiate yourselves from other people or um, if there's models of growth that we could look at that might we could learn some things from how this, this did or didn't work even if it's not just whiskey and it does get a little tricky um, we make too many different things which uh, yeah you mentioned Corsair they might be one of the only ones and I don't know how often they do all of those things but yeah we currently have 11 recipes that as of now, are on the books to be made every year. Um, there might be some that become, you know, every other year or something. Um, we also do way too much experimentation with barrels and all the different barrel profiles and, and wood species available to us. So that in that sense, that's somewhat comparable to the, the, the barrel um, management at like a scotch distillery. To a lot of new guys, a lot of American guys, if you've got, you know, a bourbon and a rye, or two different bourbon recipes and a rye, maybe you got a single malt, you got four things, all your barrels are the same. It makes it a lot more manageable. It's a lot less complex, but uh, to me, the data that we have to try and keep up with is worth it because we have we just have a lot more fun. We have a lot more variety of stuff coming across the blending table. That's just really exciting, and and uh, we. From day one, we've kind of made things we were interested in making, whether sometimes it was just as simple as um, never mess with fruit much. That's from a fermentation, from a technical perspective, that sounds like a solid challenge. It sounds like fun, and I think we'll make something we like. Sometimes it was just that simple, and sometimes uh, you just wake up one day and you realize you're drinking a lot of rye, and you go, wait a minute, I'm a distiller, why don't we make some? And you start calling up your suppliers and see what you can get to start playing around with, you know. Um, but yeah, size, I'm not really that up on everyone's volumes, so I don't know, yeah, I don't know. Um, I know with High West's expansion, I, I'm not sure where they're at with that, or Westland, I'm, I don't know, I just don't know, the Corsair was adding their, that, their new location where they do the malting and, and all yeah, that. Because they're three distillers. Yeah, so I don't really know everybody that's kind of in the same... Mm -hmm. Either got started, some of us couldn't get started around the same time, you know, late 2000s, or people that, like Weston, came, came along later, but has grown really fast and is doing great. Um, so I don't really know. Straight hands, I don't really know who, volume-wise, where we're at, where we sit with some of those guys. I don't, doesn't really, that doesn't really make much difference to me, obviously. It's, uh, it's nice, the volume gives you some leeway that we didn't have, like I said before, but uh, other than that, I mean... I had this conversation just the other day about demand and kind of thinking about it in terms of um, even kind of 
rare, obscure bottles that we've all had some time. It may not even be one of your favorite distilleries, but man, there was something you had that one time at a random bar or a friend had or it was at a tasting and you're like, man, they're not even one of my go-tos, but that bottling was exceptional. And you go find it, chase it, find it online and give yourself a few to hold back for mm -hmm. the rest of your life knowing it's, you know, it's a one-off or it was a single barrel maybe even or whatever. And so the volume, hopefully, and getting in all, getting as many markets as possible, getting in some other countries, to me the goal would be there's people out there that what we do would be right down their alley and we've just never gotten the whiskey in front of them, you know? Um, I think we're going out there trying to scalp a bunch of other people's market share or anything like that. To me it's much more simple. They're, people obviously enjoy what we do. We like it a lot. We're really proud of it. And uh, if making more and being more, scattering the net a little wider means we can find people that, just the way their palate is, this is already, it'll be a no-brainer, it'll make sense. Um, I'm trying to manufacture demand or talk some people into drinking something, you know. Um, so I don't know what that number is. When do we stop? And uh, theoretically, I guess it's when you found all the people that you needed to find and you can get enough product to them, then, then you're doing, you know, you've done your job. We were talking at lunch, and you sort of acknowledged that you think you sort of found your career niche here. You see yourself doing this 30 years from now? I guess so, yeah. I mean, I don't know what else I'd be doing. Um, I always joke that I spent a decent amount of time and money on multiple degrees and never worked a day in my life in any of those areas. So I meet guys that, one of our, my buddies who used to work here even was kind of in between just taking a year off from school and trying to figure out if he wanted to go back. And it's like, I mean, the only money I've ever made was on hobbies that I took seriously enough to see where they ended up. And it was never a goal. Yeah, I don't think I had career aspirations at all, but I wanted to make stuff. And it, that could have, it could have been a lot of things. It, it, almost, it was almost pottery. Uh, if I was a better musician, there definitely was a period where I maybe thought that was going to be music. But to get to make something, and uh, all the subtlety and intricacy that goes into the almost infinite parameters that you can play with with, with whiskey. Um, it's a pretty sweet deal, although we were joking about this earlier too. You spend a lot more time in spreadsheets and projections and meetings than probably a lot of people just think, oh, you sit around and drink whiskey all day. Um, but, but it's all worth it. That's all just groundwork. I, w I like what I do. I want to be able to keep doing what I do. I want everyone here to do well. And... Uh, if we're responsible with the business side of things, then that's the best way to ensure that we all can keep doing what we love, you know. Now, if you'd like to see what a huge pot still with a worm tub-like coil on the top looks like, just visit the WhiskeyCast website. I've posted a photo of the new spirit stills. One other note, just to compare the size of the old and new distilleries, the shed that houses the boiler at the new distillery is right about the same size as the entire building that housed the old distillery. And to be honest, the gift shop and tasting room inside is probably bigger than the old distillery too. Now that tasting room and gift shop is open almost every day, but tours of Balconis are available only by appointment. Full disclosure, I visited Balconis as the distillery's guest. But as always, full editorial control over the content of this episode remains with Whiskey Cast. And that's this week's Whiskey Cast in depth, brought to you by Lagavulin, where patience has been awarded. Lagavulin 25 is Whiskey Advocate's Isla Single Malt of the Year. This 25-year-old whiskey, matured exclusively in sherry casks, is a recognition of the distillers that have crafted Lagavulin across the years. Learn more at malts.com. A program note now, we have had many requests to bring whiskey cast virtual tastings out of hiatus, and good news, we're planning to start producing new episodes later this summer. If you're interested in being part of a tasting panel, just use the contact form on our website and let us know. The same rules apply as they did before. You need to have Skype installed on your computer, and you can't be working in the whiskey industry. I hinted on social media that we'd have something to announce on this week's show, and it's our pleasure to welcome a new sponsor to Whiskey Cast this week for the What I'm Tasting This Week department. We are glad to welcome Heaven Hill Distillery on board, and we hope to have them as part of Whiskey Cast for a long time to come.
Let's start off the tasting notes with a couple of new Irish single malts created by Stuart Nickerson for his family's Tipperary distillery. Stuart's daughter and son-in-law are laying down their own whiskey stocks for future bottlings. But in the meantime, Stuart created the Tipperary Knock Meal Downs 10-year-old from a sourced batch of single malt. It's bottled at 47% ABV, and the nose is light and floral with notes of honey, straw, vanilla, and just a hint of allspice. The taste is spicy and well-balanced with allspice and ginger root, complemented by vanilla, honey, and straw notes, while those same notes linger gently through the nice long finish. I'm scoring Tipperary's Knock Meal Downs 10-year-old Irish single malt an 88. Stewart also created the No Age Statement Watershed single malt from batches of First Fill X bourbon casks. It's also bottled at 47% ABV. The nose on Watershed has notes of caramel candy, vanilla, honey, dried flowers, and just a touch of fudge. The taste starts off with black tea, lemon, and honey, then turns peppery and stays that way through the long finish with notes of white pepper, ginger root, honey, vanilla, and a hint of oak. I'm scoring the Tipperary Watershed an 87. More tasting notes in a minute, but first, this week's tasting notes are brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery, family-owned and operated since 1935. Heaven Hill remains fiercely independent and committed to the traditions and history of American whiskey, with an award-winning range including Evan Williams and Elijah Craig Bourbons and Rittenhouse and Pikesville Rise. Meet the whole family at heavenhilldistillery.com. Now, since they ran the 24 Hours of Le Mans this weekend in France, I thought it might be fun to finish up with a French single malt, the Torbay Collection from Roselieu's Distillery in Lorraine. It's an 8-year-old peated single malt that was matured in ex-bourbon casks and finished in French oak casks and bottled at 46%. The nose has a nice peatiness with touches of iodine and creosote, balanced nicely by a good maltiness and notes of vanilla, peach pie, and lemon zest. The taste has a good balance of peatiness and maltiness with touches of coffee beans, vanilla, allspice, and honey. The finish is long, smooth, and smoky with dried fruits, dark chocolate, and a hint of vanilla. I'm scoring the Roselieu Torbay Collection French Single Malt an 88. Once again, the What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery. And I'll be adding these tasting notes to our searchable list of 1,900 different whiskeys at whiskeycast.com. That's also where you'll find links for WhiskeyCast HD and WhiskeyCast virtual tastings episodes, the latest whiskey news, events, and much more including a complete archive of past episodes. Let's keep the cask strength conversation going all week long. I'm on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and Tumblr at WhiskeyCast, and my email address is comments at whiskeycast.com. I'd love to hear from you. You don't need a special occasion to celebrate with something truly unique. But a personally engraved bottle of Johnny Walker Blue Label can make any occasion special. Support for WhiskeyCast comes from Johnny Walker. Visit johnnywalker.com to find out more about engraving options near you. WhiskeyCast. Brought to you by Redbreast. The definitive single pot still Irish whiskey. Those in the know, know Redbreast. Whiskey Cast is a production of Cask Strength Media, copyright 2017, and comes to you each week from the charming, yet regrettably dry town of Haddonfield, New Jersey. I'm Mark Gillespie, reminding you that when you drink, please drink responsibly. Thanks for listening.